Okay, so uh, hello and welcome everyone. Um, today it is my pleasure to introduce you Dr. Lior Schaeffer. Lior is an associate professor within the School of Political Science, Government and International Affairs at the Tel Aviv University. Uh, he studies elite political behavior, specifically executive decision making, and his broader interests include elections, campaigns, and legislation. He has published extensively in prestigious journals like, just to name one, American Political Science Review, and he is principal investigator in studies such as the European Local Politics Observatory. And today, his talk will focus on public support for democratic backsliding in Israel. So thank you very much, Lior, for being here, and I leave it to you. All right. Thank you so much for uh, for attending this talk and, and thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, I will say that uh, as, as uh, you may be able to infer from this uh, uh, overly generous bio um, that uh, that I usually uh, deal with politicians um, and I rarely deal with Israel in my in my work, even though I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there and I'm from there. Um, but I, it's just that my substantive interests are with elite political behavior. So, you know, if you uh, start asking me questions, you'll I'll always end up steering the conversations to like work that I do with politicians who are my subjects. I run lab experiments with politicians. So um, so this is a rare case where I get to talk about Israeli politics. Um, I am fortunate enough to be involved in this project through work that I'm doing with Noam Gidron, who is my one of my co-authors here. Um, we've been running a panel that uh, is the source of the data that I'm going to present to you today. Um, and I, uh, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, it's, it's always uh, like talking about Israel is always a flashpoint, um, certainly now. So I, I welcome any and all comments that you have. I don't, you know, I'm not afraid of talking about anything that has to do with this. I'm not representing anything but, you know, myself and my research. So, um, so feel free to like, to get into that. Do not be shy about it. I, I don't know, maybe I'm going to regret this uh, uh, open door, but I, uh, I welcome it. And, uh, and generally speaking, I don't know how you guys uh, work in terms of uh, questions and so on, but you should absolutely interrupt me, uh, especially if I'm going too fast or if I'm, uh, uh, if I'm talking about stuff that maybe is not obvious. Um, and there's a lot of background to um, this specific case that uh, I'm guessing that some of you may are, be more familiar with it with and some of you uh, less so for understandable reasons. So I'm, I'm gonna try and give some description of it, but if you feel like I need to give more details, uh, please tell me. And also if you feel like all of you know this already, then I, I don't wanna waste your time. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of an overview. Um, what we're concerned with here is explaining who supports Netany Netanyahu's government's uh, judicial overhaul which is an emblematic case of democratic backsliding. Um, and what we do is uh, present five uh, leading explanations from the literature on democratic backsliding and trying and, and trying to see whether we can actually uh, show that they are predictive of support for this reform. So, uh, and, the, and the evidence that we're using leverages a unique panel that we have that we've been running, you know, regardless of this reform, we didn't even know that it was coming. Um, but what it enabled us to do is to measure pre-reform attitudes on all of these five explanations, leader attachment, effective polarization, populist attitudes, uh, a majoritarian view of democracy and negative personal experience with the judicial system, all of which are in the literature seen as potential uh, things that explain public support for democratic backsliding. Um, I will say that uh, uh, just kind of to, you know, in, in case anybody needs to leave and you want a spoiler, um, these are, uh, we, we find overwhelmingly that uh, attachment to Netanyahu on an emotional level and effective polarization, which is animosity towards out partisans, are the strongest predictors of support for the reform, as opposed to ideology or other factors that, that uh, are discussed in the literature. Um, and there's, uh, you know, there are broader implications for these findings, both for Israeli politics, but also for the literature on democratic backsliding uh, more broadly. I will say that, you know, there's a lot of literature on democratic backsliding, on what, uh, um, you know, on why it happens, uh, how it happens. And a lot of it is understandably uh, concerned with what do leaders do? How do institutions uh, safeguard against democratic backsliding processes and what sort of institutions make it easier for these things to happen? We're focused on uh, the popular support side of it because most of these processes, are, even if they're top down, they're initiated by democratically elected leaders. And so they depend at least in part, but we would argue in large part, on popular support for them to succeed. 
And so we're asking the obvious question of who ends up supporting these sorts of processes. If they're so negative for democracy, then it's completely not obvious that that uh, there will be widespread support for them. So that's what we're trying to get at here. And what we're doing is leveraging a unique circumstance in Israel where there has been a very like clear case of a, a, of a set of uh, a, a legislative package that is directly aimed at eroding, uh, eroding uh, democratic norms and institutions. Um, and I'm just going to give you some background on the reform itself. Um, just to give you some deep background uh, for the uninitiated, I, I'm jealous of you. Um, in, uh, Israel has, has uh, been operating under the shadow of uh, Netanyahu's well long uh, uh, tenure as prime minister. Um, but specifically uh, under the shadow of his uh, continuing legal troubles, he's uh, standing trial uh, for various uh, corruption charges. He's, uh, he's accused in three different affairs um, and the trial is still ongoing. And this has been a dominating factor that is also in part responsible for the fact that we had five elections in the last four years, uh, starting in April 2019 um, and leading up to the last election in November 2022. Um, and all of these are, uh, in a way, it, this has also reoriented the political system in Israel around whether or not uh, parties are willing to be in government with Netanyahu or not, as opposed to the more traditional left-right ideological uh, uh, cleavage that revolves around the conflict. Um, and again, in, 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 uh, in terms of further background, it's important to understand that, that Israel has no constitution. Israel has a set of basic laws that have been gradually legislated uh, over the years that in spirit are supposed to be uh, amalgamated together into a constitution, but the process of which is, has not been initiated, it's also unclear how exactly this is going to happen or when this is exhausted. Um, so there's no constitution. There is a very powerful executive in Israel in terms of the relationship between the legislature, the uh, executive and the uh, uh, and the courts. The legislator uh, in Israel, the Knesset, is relatively very weak compared to the government. Um, the government has full control of the Knesset's agenda. Uh, it it overdetermines what legislation gets passed and so on. So the major means of checks and balances in Israel is the uh, is the judicial system and the Supreme Court specifically. Um, the reform itself was introduced in January uh, 2023, so three months after the election and, and shortly after the government was formed. Um, it was a, an extremely surprising introduction in that it was not part of the government's agenda until it was introduced. It, was, it did not feature in the, uh, in the campaign of Netanyahu's party, the Likud. It did not feature in the government's agenda until the justice minister, Yariv Levine, um, introduced it on January 4th. Um, so it was really a non-salient issue. Judicial issues were part of the agenda in Israel because of Netanyahu's trial, but not this concentrated effort to reform the judicial system in a way that is uh, in a way that's so uh, comprehensive. Uh, when Levine introduced the reform, he said uh, he argued that the growing intervention of the court has eroded trust, a dangerous law, and has not brought proper governance. People we did not choose decide for us. This is not democracy. So he was using language of democracy, but the substance of it was um, uh, was the following. And th there was a long list of measures that were proposed in the reform, um, but some of the highlights were uh, legislation that would curtail the Supreme Court's ability to strike down uh, Knesset legislation uh, by removing some of the clauses that it, uh, it currently uses to do that sort of thing. Um, ironically, this piece of legislation was legislated and then struck down by the courts. Um, so that is still not, uh, not in. Uh, another piece of legislation that was included in this package was uh, uh, was supposed to allow the parliament to ignore court decisions by simple majority. So if there's a, a ruling by the court to disqualify a law, uh, the Knesset can overcome this and reinstate that law with a specific majority, not legislated yet either. Um, the government was also trying to uh, change the balance of the committee that appoints judges uh, and gain an inherent majority there that would allow it to control the appointment of judges, both to the Supreme Court, but at all levels as well. Uh, which it currently does not have. Things there have to happen by consensus and involve uh, representatives of the courts, representatives, outside representatives, and so on. Um, again, this has not been legislated, but uh, the functioning of this uh, committee has effectively been frozen for months now. Um, in terms of implications or how this is perceived, what it does effectively, each of these steps, and certainly all of them together, would concentrate almost unlimited power in the hands of the executive in Israel, as a result of the measures themselves, which that are very targeted, and uh, the backdrop in which there are no other checks uh, in place, and in in 
uh, any and most writing about this, including uh, including academic writing, it is being seen as an emblematic case of top-down government-led democratic backsliding. And I'm providing this both for background, but also to persuade you that by focusing on this, we're not just giving you an anecdote about a specific uh, process in Israel, but about something that is um, very similar to other processes that have been happening elsewhere in the world. You are probably thinking about you know, other uh, clear examples from recent years, like Hungary, Poland, uh, Turkey, and so on. This sits squarely within these processes. So um, again, in, in the way of background, since it was introduced, there's been mass mobilization against the reform, um, which was expressed in, in protests that have started immediately after it, uh, it was introduced and continued until October 7th, actually. Um, they still continue, but on a far smaller scale because of everything that has happened since. Um, and support for the reform is deeply divided along political lines. So what you see here are the different parties representing the Israeli parliament, the, um, only the Jewish majority parties. I'll explain why we're using that data here. Um, and you can see uh, in blue, those are the coalition parties, orange are the opposition parties. Um, one of them has entered uh, government since the war, but I'm speaking about the pre-war uh, uh, period. And you can see that support for the reform is overwhelmingly concentrated in, uh, among coalition voters and effectively does not exist among supporters of the opposition. But you can also see that it is far from being a uniform support for the reform. If you look at the Likud and the Bards here are misleading because the Likud is by far the largest party in the coalition, um, you can see that about a third of Likud voters do not support the reform. So um, we have a, a, an interesting question here, not just on a, on a theoretical level, but also on, on an empirical level, which is that how come we have about a third of the supporters of Netanyahu's own party who do not support uh, the reform. And this amounts, if, if we combine that together, it's about 70% of uh, the coalition supporters who support the reform and 30% who do not. So it raises an important question about who ends up supporting it and who does not, even among Netanyahu's uh, coalition. So like I mentioned, there are five prominent explanations in the literature. And I'm gonna try and give you a rundown of why um, we are looking at them and what they predict. Leader attachment is the first one. Um, we know that personalistic leadership is a phenomenon that's on the rise in Western democracies in general. Israel and Italy are kind of leading the pack in that sense. They're the countries with the highest level of personalistic politics. Uh, this comes on the expense of uh, uh, standard party attachment or uh, you know ideological voting and so on. So charismatic leadership is something that is driving voting in Israel. It has been doing this for quite a while. Um, and Netanyahu is an emblematic case of a charismatic leader that um, um, that people vote for, but also people vote against him, specifically based on his personality. We also know from existing research that voters tend to align their views with the actions of their chosen leaders. So our expectation is that the more strongly voters are attached to Netanyahu on an emotional level, um, the more likely they are to support anything that he does, and specifically um, the reform which he backs and, and, uh, and promotes. Um, again, this is about charismatic leadership. This is about the idea that um, that voters are more likely to um, align to, to perceive their interests as aligned with those of the leader. So the more uh, attached those voters are to Netanyahu, the more we expect them to uh, to support the reform. Effective polarization is our second uh, you know uh, major suspect here. Effective polarization is uh, is basically hostility and animosity across party lines. It's usually conceptualized as the difference between how much you how positively you feel towards your partisan in group or your uh, block in group, if we're talking about groups of parties, and uh, how much you dislike uh, your political rivals, partisan out groups, uh, opposing blocks, and so on. But the reason we care about this as a as a, a potential precursor of support for democratic backsliding is because other work has already substantiated that negative partisanship, and I'm quoting McCoy and Sommer here, contributes to a growing perception among citizens that the opposing party and their policies pose a threat. And uh, these perceptions of threat open the door to undemocratic behavior by uh, an incumbent. And saying this does not, it does not clear the mechanism completely. Because you can imagine effective polarization, high levels of effective polarization being associated with support for democratic uh, backsliding reforms. And at least a couple of ways. One would be that these people just hate the other side so much and the other side is 
mobilized against something that the government does, that they would support it just for spite, right? You can imagine people just doing it because they know that this is hurtful for, you know, the opposition supporters. They hate them so much. There's so much animosity that they would just go and be in, in favor of it, regardless of what the substance is, just because they feel like it's, you, you know, it's doing damage to people who they dislike. The other uh, connection, the other mechanism here could be uh, more instrumental. It could be that you, it's a combination of instrument and, and emotion in that case. We, it could be that these individuals are the ones who see the likelihood of, um, who see the potential for uh, opposition supporters or for their rivals in general, um, holding power as something more threatening to them. They see it as so undesirable that even if they care about democracy, even if they, uh, you know, uh, those things, uh, you know, all things being equal would would oppose these sorts of reforms when they're introduced by their own side, when they know that the implications are that they would make it harder for the other side to gain power when they uh, when they know they would curtail their rights and their ability to operate in the, in the state, then they might end up being more supportive of it simply because they feel threatened by those uh, by, by those out partisans. And because their own hostility towards them lowers the bar for accepting these sorts of behaviors, even if they otherwise disagree with them. Just to give you a sense of effective polarization levels in Israel, what you see here are kind of differences between in-party and out-party sentiments across uh, um, the last several decades. And the black line should give you a sense of how uh, con you know consistently increasing effective polarization has been in Israel. So it's not just that we're uh, you know we're thinking about this as an explanation, but it's a prominent feature of the Israeli political system. At the same time, Israel is not an outlier in terms of effective polarization levels. They've been growing elsewhere as well. And when you look at international comparisons, Israel is sitting at like a very like you know uh, standard like you know place in the middle of the uh, distribution here. So we're not looking at something very extreme, but we are seeing this as a phenomenon that has been growing in prominence in Israel. The third explanation that we're considering is populism. Populism is is um, is considered the worldview in which uh, you know politics is a moral confrontation between the pure people and a corrupt elite. Um, and there's been you know in, in existing accounts, populist voters are uh, thought of as disgruntled with how the democratic regime functions. You don't have to be authoritarian as a populist to dislike how democracy functions. You can support democracy, but still be in a position to say, well, I mean, the will of the people is not being expressed by the current regime or by the current system because there are kind of secretive, undemocratic uh, powers or institutions that are curtailing our, you know, like the ability of leaders who express my will or the will of the people to do what they want. And this is a classic talking point for populist leaders, of course, um, and the, the reason to attack the media, the courts, uh, the bureaucracy and so on is exactly because it, it uh, creates a contrast between them as representatives of the people's pure will and those elites. Um, so again, here we also expect that people who, uh, who espouse stronger populist attitudes would be more likely to support uh, democratic backsliding reforms, not because they don't want a democracy, but maybe because the reform is packaged in a way that appeals to that idea. Um, uh, Leo, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have a question in the chat. By, by yeah, I just noticed. Sorry, uh, go ahead. Had a long comment, so but uh, I'll try to read it. Uh, we have maybe I don't know if we cannot talk or something. Um, no, no can I can you... talk. I just didn't want to. Okay, okay. So you, you, dis... you can ask me directly. Okay, brilliant. I didn't want to um, you know, <laughs> disrupt your presentation. It's really great so far. Um, so yeah, all I just said was we have a similar thing going on here in the UK. Um, and just anecdotally, 66% of the UK population support a ceasefire in the Israel-Palestine conflict, with only 13% opposing it. But despite the widespread support and the protests, we have started to see um, a moral panic, I would say, amongst MPs and the media. Um, and we've even had last week the Speaker of the House of Commons um, alter parliamentary procedure to prevent one of the minority parties from... Um, tabling a vote on the ceasefire um, and now we're seeing calls for further curtailing of people's right to protest from ministers and MPs so as a, as a result of the moral panic so they're concerned about MP safety um, which I suppose is a valid concern considering in recent years we have seen safety issues but I was just wondering whether or not moral panic amongst the elite can also explain or potentially confound this uh, like the effect that populism has on on democratic backsliding 
That's an interesting question. I mean, first of all, I'm not an expert on British politics, so I'm, I'm uh, unfortunately I, like kind of unaware of, of you know those more recent developments. So I apologize. Yeah, nor am I. I I'm nor not am well I, but... to speak to that, but I I feel like there's you know perceptions of politicians about you know about public opinion, but also about you know the threats to themselves or threats to the system are are extremely important very understudied in the context of democratic backsliding primarily because it's very difficult to you know to directly assess those things with elites like i said i am very uh, uh favorably predisposed towards talking about that side of things but i should keep it to the end so maybe let's get back to that if we have time in the q a or we can talk about this later i just don't want to derail kind of the stated purpose of this if that's okay with you that's absolutely fine that's why i popped it in the chat because i didn't want to uh, disrupt anything in case it makes more sense later on right. but well thank you i appreciate it yes um all right so we talked a little bit about po populism and why we expect that to be a, a potential uh predictor of uh support for democratic backsliding the other uh the fourth one is is uh related but distinct from populism which is a kind of a more ideologically based uh, majoritarian view of democracy um, a majoritarian view of democracy is one in which the will, you know, is people thinking that the will of the majority should trump other considerations and should not be institutionally constrained. So it's kind of a thin view of democracy, right? Like a, a democracy is simply um, a system in which the majority does what the majority wants. And this is contrasted with kind of a thicker, or let's say, a liberal view of democracy in which, um, uh, you know, it's not just majority rule. It's also protection of minority rights or the rights of the uh, political minority and protection of civil rights in general. Um, Again, in existing writing um, about democratic backsliding, the, there's this idea that early derogation, uh, and I'm, again, I'm quoting Haggard and uh, Kaufman here, uh, particularly the removal of a horizontal check bolstered by majoritarian justifications, which is exactly how this government in Israel has been talking about the reform, uh, is what sets the stage for further derogation and the decline of democracy itself. So you can imagine that people who have kind of this, you know, individual like, um, uh, endogenous support for this view of how democracy should work should support the reform, not because they want to end up with a dictatorship, but because their view of democracy aligns with what this reform uh, promises to do. So this would be kind of the ideological explanation for it. There's just a constituency for the reform. And if people support it, it's because they're part of this constituency. Just to give you a sense of how much this is on the agenda in Israel, um, these are just quotes from Netanyahu on the right and from Esther Hayut, who was the uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, chief in Israel uh, during the introduction of the reform. Um, you know, Netanyahu's comments about the reform and about the election was that the opposition just refuses to accept the election outcome and, and the majority's will, strongly relying on that. It's really like discourse that speaks to the will of the majority. Um, Esther Hayut, uh, in her comments to uh, uh, Levine, the justice minister's introduction of the reform uh, in early January, said, among other things, that democracy is not simply majority rule and, and, and views like that are, um, are basically undemocratic. So again, this is a, an ideological clash in addition to the rest of what's going on. And finally, we were interested in looking at negative personal experiences with the judicial system um, with the expectation that people who just, you know, who were who feel like they have been harmed by the judicial system, you know, like had unfair judgments or uh, delayed procedures or whatnot, are just more likely to support any kind of reform uh, of the judicial system if it's portrayed in a way that makes them feel like this is dealing with the problems that they've had. Um, this ties into existing literature uh, that shows that lived experiences tend to translate into political preferences. It, it's about things that go beyond, way beyond those kinds of experiences, right? Climate change and so on. So we're taking a page from that literature and just uh, putting out this expectation as well. Our empirical approach uh, consists of leveraging the panel that I mentioned. It's called the Israeli Polarization Panel. Um, what it is is uh, a set of uh, basically Noam Gidron and I, before the April 2019 election in Israel, were naively interested in, in just looking at how effective polarization levels in Israel have uh, you know fluctuate around elections. So we figured, all right, there's an election coming. Let's survey the same individuals a couple of times before the election and then a couple of times after the election and just you know work with what we have because we thought that elections condition effective polarization levels which they do, by the way. Um, but what we didn't know was that there was not going to be any resolution to that election, that six months later is going to be another election, and then another one a year later, and so on, and so on, like five times. Um, and, you know, because we started talking to these people, we just continued to do that. So we ended up 
repeating the same questions and, and looking at a host of things over time with the same individuals that we started with. We started with about 2,400 individuals. Um, and the waves that I'm going to present you data from are waves 11 and 12 of this project. So really, I cannot wait to get off of this thing. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, you can, you can see how it kind of, you know, deviated into things that I absolutely did not expect to, uh, to deal with, but I mean, I guess, yeah, hopefully science benefits because personally it's, uh, it's taken a toll. Um, and, uh, one major limitation that we have in panel studies in Israel is that, uh, there are no vendors who are able to, uh, give us a serious, uh, representative sample of, uh, Arab Israelis or Arab citizens of Israel. And this is a huge problem, like a systemic problem in Israel, something that has, uh, you know, has been problematic for us on substantive grounds, but also on a, on basic ethical grounds. Um, we, like, we canvas the turf. We know all the, the pollsters in Israel. There's just no way of, of getting uh, a re-interview sample of, uh, uh, any, uh, that, that nears in any kind of way a representative sample in Israel of Arab speaking uh, respondents. So we're, we've got a real problem there. Um, and what it means is that we have almost no Arab uh, respondents in our in our um, in our data. The the one thing that like lets us get away with it concretely here is the fact that we're concentrated on coalition supporters. There are no Arab parties in coalition. There's effectively no Arab uh, voters for the coalition, other than a very small number of uh, uh, of Druze Israelis. So um, so in that sense, it doesn't change much. But in the paper, which I'm happy to share with you, by the way, we do a lot of work to substantiate that if we include and exclude uh, air respondents uh, in our sample, it won't uh, change support levels uh, meaningfully. We do that using other non-panel studies uh, of, the of the reform um, that we use off of uh, other sources. We feel that the pre-reform wave right before the January 4th introduction of the reform. So what it allows us to do is to capture attitudes before the shock uh, that the overhaul itself caused. And that's important because uh, for our purposes, what we know about democratic backsliding is normally stuff that people measure once there is democratic backsliding. And what we care, and, and this is a problem just in terms of inference, because there could be just sorting. People could adjust their views subsequently after the introduction based on what they think about the, so based on what they think about those measures. So in terms of we can't substantiate causality, but we can at least like eliminate one of the potential causes for reverse causality here um, and sorting into support and opposition based on certain factors. So we're able to measure a lot of the things that we care about before the election, sorry, before the reform, not the election. And then obviously we measure support for the reform after it's introduced because nobody know, knew that it was coming. So we couldn't ask people about whether or not they would support the reform uh, before the thing itself got realized. Um, so that's what we have going. I do want to show you what we like, how close to the introduction of the reform we were by accident. Um, we fielded this 11th wave of the IPP on Jan between January 2nd and 9th. So we actually have 150 post-reform responses in our survey because the reform was introduced on January 4th. What I'm showing you here is the accumulation of responses in this wave. It's split between opposition and coalition supporters, just so you believe me that there's no kind of differential uh, um, you know, responses, at, at least not in respect to the, uh, uh, to the introduction of the reform. So you see that the overwhelming majority of respondents in this wave uh, answered it before the press conference was uh, um, was broadcast. Nobody knew what it was going to be about in terms of substance. So we're not worried about like very close uh, um, responses to the uh, press conference. And then we have this long, shallow tail of about 150 people who um, who completed the survey subsequently. So they're eliminated from the analysis because we want pre uh, introduction opinions. But this is nice because we know that what these people felt was what they felt right before this happened. So it minimizes the uh, potential for other confounding events to condition what we see. And then we uh, measured support for the reform in a post-reform wave, um, which happened in April at the, uh, the height of uh, mobilization against, uh, against the reform. Um, we have about 700 uh, plus people who took both waves. There are more who participated in other waves of the IPP, but we're interested specifically in those who did the pre-reform, post-reform waves. And because we wanted to get around uh, potential concerns with attrition, we also recruited a fresh sample uh, of people who we just interviewed after the reform, um, and they number about 1,600. This allows us for a nice contrast to see if there's actual sorting. So we can compare the uh, predictive value of pre-reform uh, attitudes on reform support with what people thought after the reform and how that predicts reform support. And you'll see that there are interesting differences if we can get to it. So I'm back to that uh, slide on uh, support for the reform. Where it comes from is our main dependent variable, which is do you support or oppose the judicial system reform? 
that the government is promoting. We asked this in the post-reform wave. It's a five-point scale, which we uh, recode to a binary variable. So if you say strongly support or support, you get a one, otherwise you get a zero. Um, and here are explanatory variables. I'll just go over this briefly so you know what you're looking at. Uh, leader attachment is a basic Netanyahu thermometer question. What is your attitude towards Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? It goes from zero to 10, where zero is rejection, hatred, and 10 is support or sympathy. We measured effective polarization by asking our respondents to rate the different parties in the Israeli parliament. Um, again, on a thermometer, that's a standard way of measuring effective polarization. So what is your attitude towards each of the following parties on a zero to 10 scale? And what we did was to, uh, for each respondent, we did a weighted mean of their out party sentiment. So if you remember, if you voted for an opposition party, we take the uh, weighted mean of your sentiment towards all of the coalition parties. And if you're a coalition voter, then we take the weighted mean of all of, uh, of the ratings that you provided for parties in the opposition. So we're just looking at out party animosity in that case. We have other specifications where we look at the difference between how people feel towards their parties or their blocks and uh, the out parties, the results remain the same. So just to, to ease your mind, if you care deeply about uh, measuring effective polarization, which a lot of people do, by the way. Um, we measured populism using a subset of questions that appear in the comparative study of election systems, which is a comparative study of election systems, but basically is done after elections in a host of countries in waves. Um, so these are three kind of main items. The people should take the important policy decisions, not politicians. Most politicians don't care about the people and what people call compromise in politics is in fact the betrayal of principles. So the, all of these feature in this battery. There's some, some to say about like its relevance for our purposes, but I'm going to get to that later. For majoritarianism, there is a question that repeats that that recurs in the Israeli national election study, where voters are asked to uh, make a choice between uh, make a dichotomous choice between two options. For uh, they're basically asked uh, which of these views on the nature of democracy do you agree with? One is that every sorry about the typo. One is that every regime that follows the principle of majority rule is democracy, and the other one is that for a regime to be truly democratic, it must observe principles such as human rights. And what we did was instead of making it a binary choice, we put it on a zero to 10 spectrum, like on a slider. And we asked respondents to place themselves there because we figured that it might give us like more, uh, uh, just a deeper insight into how they felt about this debate. And finally, entanglement with the law, where we just asked them, you know, were you or a close relative of yours unfairly treated by Israeli law enforcement authorities in recent years? And the response categories were no, just once or several times. We recoded this. Uh, this is just a summary table. I'm going to get back to this if you have other questions about how we went, you know, finagled everything to, to fit with this. Let me just show your results. Um, so first of all, we're looking at binary uh, independent variables. So for example, for leader attachment or personalism, we took the thermometer and we split it not by the median, but we split it uh, so that we have uh, very high support, very high attachment to Netanyahu. And if you look at the distribution, that means like eight to 10 and the rest of it, everybody. So if you look at the top left panel here, I don't know if you can see my cursor. High here are everyone who have very strong attachment to Netanyahu and low is everybody else. And you can see just a dramatic difference in support for the reform. Of those who have very strong attachment to Netanyahu, 81% support the reform or end up supporting the reform because we measured their level of attachment before it was introduced. So this is predictive of support for the reform. And of those with a, a low or negative view of Netanyahu, only you know under 15% supported. Um, if we look at majoritarianism, which is kind of the ideological sort, and you can see that those who have a, a high here uh, refers to those who have a narrow uh, definition of democracy, right? Who kind of go with that spectrum uh, more. And you see that even those with a narrow definition of democracy, sure, they support the reform more, but even among that group, it's under 50%. And of course, those with a uh, with a you know thicker view of democracy, a liberal view of democracy, tend to uh, report a very low level of support for the reform. For effective polarization, we had to split the sample between opposition and coalition supporters because we had different expectations. We expected those in the opposition who are more effectively polarized to oppose the reform more, and we expected those in the coalition who are more effectively polarized to strong more strongly support it. So you can see that if we just look at opposition supporters, none of them really supports the reform, but those who are more effectively polarized support it even less. It's an effective zero. If you look at coalition supporters, those who are not very effectively polarized do support the reform. And you know there's a clear majority, it's about 66%, but those who are highly effectively polarized support it to the tune of 90%. So again, you can see an important differentiation. It's like a 25% point difference. 
Uh, populism doesn't seem to make a difference. You know, if you look at between low and high and entanglement with the law does make a difference here. You see the people who did report that they had a negative history with the uh, judicial system. Um, a majority of them support uh, support the reform relative to those with low, uh, those who didn't report it. I'm seeing that there's Leo, a question. we have a question. Yes. Yes. Go yeah. ahead. Just a quick one. Are the predictors lagged? In other words, is that from the previous wave before? Yes. The yes, that's the point of what we're doing. We get the we get to know we get to predict it because we measured all these things other than entanglement with the law before right. the reform was introduced. Yeah. So this is kind of the same, but we use the continuous variable. So we just see the you know the continuous relationship between each of the uh, independent variables of interest and support for the reform. I just want you to take a look at uh, what's useful here is that you can see in the backdrop the distribution of uh, uh, on those variables that we are interested in. So for the Netanyahu thermometer, you can see that it's a clear bimodal distribution, right? People either hate Netanyahu or love Netanyahu. You don't get a lot in the middle. Um, for definition of, definition of democracy, in contrast, you can see that actually most Israelis have a fairly liberal view of democracy. And this is true, by the way, even for most uh, supporters of Netanyahu's coalition. So there's a very kind of narrow, thin tail of those who have a, like, a clear majoritarian view of democracy. So even though this is predictive of uh, support for the reform, there's not a lot of, like, there's not a lot of movement because the, the distribution is skewed. And when you look at effective polarization, what you see here is out party dislike, and again, we separated it to opposition and coalition supporters. You can see it by the different colors. What I want you to see, first of all, is that for both of them, everybody just hates the other side, right? Um, the distribution is really skewed towards hate. Um, and for coalition supporters, those who hate the most are those who support the reform the most. So finally, what I have to show you is just a model that takes into all of these things together to kind of adjudicate between the competing explanations and show you the relative strength. I hope that I'm on time. Yeah, I'm gonna get this done. Um, just a standard linear model with the binary reform support is the DV. We had alternative specification with logit and stuff. That all, all looks the same. We used uh, continuous uh, predictors, which we rescaled to have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one. So I can show you what is the percentage point change in support when you see a one standard deviation increase or decrease. Um, and then we had separate models where we did binary specifications just as robustness checks. We control for a host of demographic uh, characteristics. And we also alternately control for left-right self-identification, which, uh, like I mentioned, captures uh, attitudes towards the conflict in Israel, most you know, above and beyond everything else. Um, and what we also do is that we estimate models separately for, like, we first estimate models for the entire sample, so coalition and opposition supporters together, and then we we focus just on coalition supporters. So let me show you what this looks like. Here are the uh, estimates from models that just look at coalition, sorry, that look at everybody together, coalition and opposition. Okay. Um, the diamonds are like the basic models and with the X's are the estimates for models where we also controlled for ideology, self-placement self uh, on the left-right scale. And you can see that it looks exactly the same. So, you know, that, that was for us just to substantiate that this is not driven by attitudes towards the conflict. This is not a proxy for something else. And you can see that personal attachment to Netanyahu is by far the strongest predictor here. If you, you know, one standard deviation increase in support for Netanyahu, is associated with a 19 percentage point increase in uh, the likelihood of supporting the reform after it's introduced. So this is a, it's a major effect here. And the other ones, well, populism doesn't play any role. Entanglement with the law, majoritarianism, and also effective polarization have a significant uh, um, predictive role here. Um, but again, like less than half of the size of personalism. But the question then becomes, what happens when we just look at coalition supporters? Because we already know that support for the reform is concentrated in the coalition. And we also know that the political blocks in Israel are basically sorted according to whether people like Netanyahu or not. Everybody in the coalition likes Netanyahu. Everybody in the opposition dislikes Netanyahu. There is shades to that in the coalition. They don't all like rate him at, at a 10, but it's very difficult to find somebody who's under a six in the coalition. So when we just look at coalition supporters, the, this is the relative impact of uh, our uh, potential explanatory variables. And you can see that the role of personalism is diminished but amazingly, even though the system is perfectly sorted by attachment to Netanyahu, even if we just look at the block that's like explicitly pro Netanyahu, you can see that the, those who are more strongly attached to Netanyahu are the ones who are uh, more likely to end up supporting the reform. And we can also show, see that effective polarization is equal in terms of its predictive power. So you can see that those who are, you know, those who hate the, uh, you know, the, the other side the most are the ones who end up supporting the reform uh, in greater numbers. Um, Leo, sorry to interrupt. We have another yes. question from Luke that was also backed up by Kia. So, Luke, do you want to? 
Yes, go ahead. Uh, so who wants to ask the question? Well, I, I'm going to read the question from the chat. Is the view of democracy, majoritarian versus human rights, binary and independent? Why cannot democracy both be majoritarian and support human rights? Surely they are not on the same scale? Oh, but they are, at least in terms of like existing theory, right? Um, basically, I mean, we're, we're offering people a way to adjudicate between those things. Like if you have a view that this is not contradictory, you would put yourself in the middle on the scale. But historically, this has been measured like in a, using a, a binary um, um, differentiation, which adopts the view that it's either this or that. Or like if you had to prioritize or, you know, make a make a choice, this is where you put yourself in. Um, I do think that they're contradictory by definition, right? Because if it's just the majority's will, then it entails that there is no consideration of other features of the of potential features of democracy, like protection of rights, right? Um, it's a really clear, like very simple, very narrow view of what democracy is. And it's not just a theoretical thing. And this is how it's promoted by uh, by leaders who promote democratic backsliding. If you listen to somebody like Erdogan, if you listen to uh, Orban, this is the kind of rhetoric that they use, right? It's the will of the people. We cannot be constrained. If this is what people want, then this is what needs to happen, et cetera. The contrasting view is that there is a responsibility uh, for uh, governments in, in democratic societies to also offer protections to minorities from the tyranny of the majority. So that's a classic normative debate um, in uh, in that literature. So that's that's my response to that. Um, and we're picking up on, on existing debates. So it's isn't like we didn't invent this. We just took it and kind of spread it out so we can see shades in it, which has not been done before. And actually is really interesting in and on its own, but uh, it's beyond the scope of what I'm presenting here today. So the last thing I wanna show you is that, um, is what happens when we um, look not at pre-election attitudes, but at post-reform measurement. And um, and Stephen, I don't know if uh, you know this kind of speaks back to what you asked. The results that I showed you so far is stuff that we measured with our respondents before the reform was introduced. And one of the concerns that people have with those kinds of uh, exercises is that most of the most of the data that we have comes from post-reform introduction or post-democratic backsliding attitudes. So our augmented sample was post-reform, and we measured all of our IVs post-reform with them. Um, you can see their results in the uh, in the solid uh, dots here, where the um, the diamonds are uh, the original results with the pre-reform uh, data. And what I want to point your attention to is what's happening here with personalism for coalition supporters. You can see that for the, basically the estimate for the impact of personalism is really inflated for uh, when we measure it with you know post-reform, when we don't have the benefit of ha of going back in time and looking at what predicts it. And we think that part of it is really because of sorting. Um, and that tells us something about how those kinds of re results could be skewed if we don't use pre-reform measures. Like it basically tells us something about the, the level of sorting, how motivated reasoning might be um, um, putting people into different holes in that, uh, you know, in these debates. So just to conclude, what we are able to show here is that at least in Israel, support for democratic backsliding is associated primar primarily with emotional attachment to Netanyahu and emotional dejection uh, from the other side, so hatred towards political rivals. It's important to keep in mind that this is also exactly what predicts opposition to the reform, right? The more you hate Netanyahu and the more you hate the you know voters of the coalition or the coalition parties, the more likely you are to oppose the reform. So it's you know it's a two-way street. We don't find any like a meaningful association with bottom-up policy demand through at least a majoritarian view of democracy, and it definitely does not appear to be related to populist attitudes. Um, all of this fits with existing accounts of, uh, of liberal democracy erosion, like the, you know, like what Larry Bertel says, where the view is that this is top down. There's no constituency for it, but rather that charismatic leaders and are able to use both their popular, you know, uh, both their uh, uh, popularity and uh, the uh, existing rifts in society to make these issues uh, passable to the public and in legislatures. Um, and this is important because we also think that, you know, in Israel, one of the things that happened is that the reform did not really pass as intended. It was huge mobilization. And so if until now we are, we thought about leader attachment as something that is just strongly predictive of it, and it's certainly the case in, in, in Israel, it could be a double-edged sword because if the leader is so prominent and so polarizing, it could also be predictive of opposition to any measures that they take. So there should be probably like a sweet spot for these leaders who try to erode democracy, where beyond it, 
it might also backfire for them because they're so prominent, because it's their label that is driving it. So this, again, opens up the door for further theoretical discussion about this. I have some more words to say about um, like open questions here and further research plans, but I, I don't want to belabor you because I've already gone over like the 40 minute uh, mark here, I think. So I will uh, open this up for questions. I'm happy to talk about everything that you like around, or dislike around this but, and everything that you'd like to talk about beyond uh, this paper. Um, thank you for paying attention, especially uh, on Zoom where it's harder to do. I really appreciate your time uh, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leo. That was very interesting. Um, before we start with questions, just uh, and we have we already have a few. Just a reminder that we have a follow up meeting after this, where third year students will present uh, their projects. So I know many of you will have to go, but anybody is more than welcome to stay for some feedback. So let's start with the questions. I can see Kia as a as a question already. Uh, yes, thank you. That was really interesting, uh, especially given the recent work myself and. Um, Steve, as well as Christoph, have been doing over the sort of last year and a half. Uh, I was wondering uh, about the role of populism that you mentioned, that that really didn't seem to play a role. Do you think that might have something to do with the lack of constitution in Israel or because based on sort of what, I, what I've seen during the readings I've done is that most countries do have constitutions. But do you think that the special role of lack of constitution in Israel might have something to do with these findings that you've had? It's an interesting question. I think that, I mean, my first guess uh, would be that it's it's a measurement issue, because if you remember the questions that we've had there, they speak about kind of like the people versus politicians. But really, the reform is, is based on a contrast between the people and non-elected um, elites, right? So maybe if we had a different battery here, or maybe if we're, you know, maybe we're conceptualizing populism, even though we're using established scales, maybe this is just not capturing what populist attitudes um, with respect to the reform are relevant, you know, would, would capture. So that's one potential explanation. Um, another would be that in Israel, populism is just not like, a, you know, it just doesn't drive a lot of behavior, right? Maybe you can have populist leaders, but maybe there's not a big populist constituency, um, mm -hmm. which is something that, you know, is worth considering because th these things are not uniformly distributed around the world, I suppose. Um, and politics is organized in a very different way in Israel than it is in other places. So I don't know, maybe the people just live, have a different attitude towards elites, right? Like the, the, there's not a lot of, like you, you have to have a certain amount of like respect and also like conspiratorial thinking, I think towards the kind of what elites do. And Israel is even, you know, on the basis of being so tightly knit and you just see those people on the street, like I think it's like the level of disrespect makes it harder to hold on to these uh, um, to these views. But this is, I'm, I'm, I mean, these are just conjectures. Whether or not it has to do with having a constitution, I don't know. I'm actually interested in hearing what you think, because it seems like, you know, you probably know the literature about how this ties into existing kind of immutable uh, institutions better than I do. So tell me about it if you like. Um, um, and I'm I curious to hear about your research, because you said it's related to it. It's, it's a very interesting paper that we are still waiting the reviews on. Uh, but basically, the big thing that we found was that elite norm violations were the drivers of democratic backsliding. I don't think we necessarily really considered constitutions as such as the sort of backbones of democracy. They were merely something that served as uh, safeguards there to, you know, hold uh, people and um, uh politicians accountable but i was just wondering because we didn't really uh, consider israel as one of the cases because it is an ongoing uh, situation and we were looking at near misses of democracy but i think we have so many questions that i want to give the floor to others thank you very much uh and it was a really interesting talk again thanks thank you kia thank you Lior. uh constantinos we have another question yeah thank you very much extremely interesting and important research right and I come from Greece, where we 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 are in, on the same traje trajectory. Not yet there, but we are on the same trajectory with our current prime minister. He's also trying to increase his power immensely. Uh, so, in turn, I I also have a question about populism, right? I am a bit troubled about the word, and I I am I, I am skeptical about whether these these items really measure populism as a construct, or if actually they are more capturing something. Uh, mixed between populism, like conspiratorial thinking, and critical uh, attitude towards uh, status quo. Because you showed three items, if I'm not mistaken, and one of them I completely agreed in terms of being critical towards the way that politics is done. So in terms of lack of transparency. And uh, so I think it's very difficult to find 
uh, an effect of, of uh, such a multi-item uh, construct when these items are capturing different uh, dimensions. So right. that would be my, my skepticism. I don't know what your, what your thoughts are. I agree, and we've gotten similar responses from from uh, uh, reviewers on this on this point. So, and we're actually like we're we've gotten an R and R for this one uh, um, just a few weeks ago. So uh, we're we're struggling with how to uh, how to approach this. Um, but um, I, I I also think that it's an issue. I think that like the, the conceptualization of populism is is really like the the crux of this here. And it would be interesting to, to consider whether either you know doing just one of the items like you know in, in running models with one of those items out of the three. Uh, replacing them each at a time would result in something different. Um, but again, I think that they're also problematic because they're not directly, re you know, relating to the kind of conflict that the uh, backsliding reform in Israel captures, which is between non-elected elites and uh, and other politicians. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's an open question. We can look at it for sure. But I feel like if ideally, if I could go back in time, I would just use a different battery of populism. We just had it because we had different purposes. We didn't know that we were going to be using it for this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalez. Uh, Christoph has a question and then Steve. Yes, thank you so much. Super interesting paper and even more interesting topic. And we, as Kira mentioned, we are working on something similar. And I'm wondering in this um, context about the lack of uh, also effect of populism, but also the huge relevance of um, Netanyahu's popularity or the attachment um, to Netanyahu. I'm wondering whether um, one of the causes why populism is not as effective here, or maybe why leadership of Netanyahu is as important, is that the backsliding case here with the um, undermining of the judiciary is maybe not close enough to people's lives. As you've mentioned, that um, lived experience translates into political preferences, and just like a constitutional court is just not something people encounter every day, right? It's something that people have um, exposure to at the fringes of their life, maybe. So if there is something that hits closer to home, maybe then populism or something, uh, some other variables become more important compared to um, the um, identification with the leader. It could be very, really could be the case. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the like the constitutional court in Israel is very prominent, like a salient feature of Israeli life. Um, as, you know, for, for a host of reasons, but like they, they make like major decisions and I think that though, I, it, in theory, you could test this because obviously it became more, you know, like it became a more salient institution once the reform was introduced, both because the reform targeted it and because it became an actor involved in whether, you know, in, in deciding its fate. So we could look at whether, you know, whether populism made a difference. You know, I don't know if we have in, in the 12th wave, if we have a measure of the salience of or like knowledge of the Supreme Court, but it, it should be sweeping. If we have it, though, in theory, we could differentiate between people of, like based on their level of exposure and see what populism does. Right. Um, it's a potential explanation. It's part one of those things where, you know, the, like the data limits our ability to make inferences on that. But it's absolutely one thing that could happen. Yeah, thank you. Steve. Uh, thanks. Um... Two points or comments. The first one, um, a specific question about the similarities um, to Poland, um, where the ports were also part of the backsliding operation in a, in a very strange way. I mean, I think they sort of introduced this parallel system of kangaroo courts that were ideologically motivated and that are now being dismantled under the new government, or at least I hope they will be. Um, so I was just wondering if you can draw some parallels there or differentiations, how the two things are similar and different. I mean, I, 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 again, I want to preface by saying that I'm not an expert on the Polish case by any stretch, right? Like my knowledge of, of the facts there is derived from reading the news most, you know, more than anything. Um, I do, rem I, I do think that one thing that really like makes a difference in these cases is the, I mean, and it's all like in the, you know, in the minute details of like constitutional authority and willingness to exercise it by the courts. Um, and in Israel, it was a very rare instance. And we can, you know, we can look at parallels between Israel and the US in that sense of there being a, a liberal majority in the court um, that, what it did was ensure that certain legislation would necessarily be struck down. 
Um, but that liberal majority, even though it's not elected, was still like, you know, dependent on its like its legitimacy hinged on public support for these rulings, right? On making it clear to other uh, powerful actors in Israel that if it strikes down a law, the, that, you know, the public would would back it. Um, and I think that these little like, dynamics really matter for the court's ability to do those sorts of things. And it seems to me like in Poland, maybe that was either because, you know, like mobilization took some time and the government was quick enough to make that change or because the composition of the existing Supreme Court was uh, was such that they didn't, you know, they didn't want to act in ways that would upset it. I think there was like an appointment issue there. Right. Um, but I forget. Um, so I, I what I'm reluctant to say is to like reluctant to do is to draw like sweeping conclusions about those things i think that a lot of it is really and some people have written about this a lot of this really depends on the specific arrangement the specific political like political power balance that you have at a given point in time just to give an illustration um basically there the supreme court is missing two uh justices now they've retired because that committee of uh judge appointment ju uh, the committee that appoints judges did not convene because the, the justice minister is preventing it from doing from convening um, now there is a conservative majority in the Supreme Court. So it was a matter of days in terms of striking down that first piece of legislation that the court did. If that, if that majority was not in place, if the conservative majority was in place instead, which happened weeks afterwards, then that piece of legislation would probably not have been uh, disqualified. And that would have created a whole other thing like that might have opened you know, the floodgates for the rest of the process. So I, I just think that those things are extremely contingent. Um, and beyond that, I, I mean, it just makes me curious to reread about the Polish case, honestly. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think I'll leave it at that because we're out of time, Fabio. So. Yeah, yeah, we are, I mean, almost at the top of the hour and then see any other uh, question incoming. So I think we can we can stop this here. And uh, I want to thank you, Lior, again, uh, very much for attending this and everybody here in the room. Uh, it was very interesting and the discussion was very lively. Also, there are a few links in the chat that I will um, save and put on the air table, uh, the one about past meetings. So I guess like, so unless we are not lost. And also another reminder that, yeah, in a few minutes, we will start with another meeting in this, this same room with where third year students will present, or two groups of third year students will present their research. I know many of you will have to go, but anybody is free to stay. So thank you again. I'll stop the recording and um, well, I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your comments. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks a lot.